Lecture 2, No Other Gospel, Galatians 1 verses 6-9 By H. A. Ironside I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed, verses 6-9. Those are very strong words, and I can quite understand that some people may have difficulty in reconciling them with the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Twice the Apostle pronounces a curse upon those who preach any other gospel than that which he himself had proclaimed to these Galatians when they were poor sinners, and which had been used of God to lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some might ask, is this the attitude of the Christian minister, to go about cursing people who do not agree with him? No, and it certainly was not Paul's attitude. Why, then, does he use such strong language? It is not that he himself is invoking a curse upon anyone, but he is declaring, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, that divine judgment must fall upon anyone who seeks to pervert the gospel of Christ or to turn people away from that gospel. In other words, the Apostle Paul realizes the fact that the gospel is God's only message to lost man, and that to pervert that gospel, to offer people something else in place of it, for a man to attempt to foist upon them an imitation gospel is to put in jeopardy the souls of those who listen to him. Our Lord Jesus Christ emphasized this when he pointed out that those men who taught people to trust in their own efforts for salvation were blind leaders of the blind, and that eventually both leader and led would fall into the dit chapter it is a very serious thing to mislead men along spiritual lines, it is a terrible thing to give wrong direction when souls are seeking the way to heaven. I remember reading a story of a woman who with her little babe was on a train going up through one of the eastern states. It was a very wintry day. Outside a terrific storm was blowing, snow was falling, and sleet covered everything. The train made its way along slowly because of the ice on the tracks and the snowplow went ahead to clear the way. The woman seemed very nervous. She was to get off at a small station where she would be met by some friends, and she said to the conductor, You will be sure and let me know the right station, won't you? Certainly, he said just remain here until I tell you the right station. She sat rather nervously and again spoke to the conductor, You won't forget me? No, just trust me. I will tell you when to get off. A commercial man sat across the aisle, and he leaned over and said, Pardon me, but I see you are rather nervous about getting off at your station. I know this road well. Your station is the first stop after such and such a city. These conductors are very forgetful, they have a great many things to attend to, and he may overlook your request, but I will see that you get off all right. I will help you with your baggage. Oh, thank you, she said. And she leaned back greatly relieved. By and by the name of the city she mentioned was called, and he leaned over and said, the next stop will be yours. As they drew near to the station she looked around anxiously for the conductor, but he did not come. You see, said the man, he has forgotten you. I will get you off, and he helped her with her baggage, and as the conductor had not come to open the door, he opened it, and when the train stopped he stepped off, lifted her bag, helped her off, and in a moment the train moved on. A few minutes later the conductor came and looking all about said, Why, that is strange. There was a woman here who wanted to get off at this station. I wonder where she is. The commercial man spoke up and said, Yes, you forgot her, but I saw that she got off all right. Got off where? the conductor asked. When the train stopped. But that was not a station. That was an emergency stop. I was looking after that woman. Why, man, you have put her off in a wild country district in the midst of all this storm where there will be nobody to meet her. There was only one thing to do, and although it was a rather dangerous thing, 
they had to reverse the engine and go back a number of miles, and then they went out to look for the woman. They searched and searched, and finally somebody stumbled upon her, and there she was frozen on the ground with her little dead babe in her arms. She was the victim of wrong information. If it is such a serious thing to give people wrong information in regard to temporal things, what about the man who misleads men and women in regard to the great question of the salvation of their immortal souls? If men believe a false gospel, if they put their trust in something that is contrary to the word of God, their loss will be not for time only but for eternity. And that is why the Apostle Paul, speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses such strong language in regard to the wickedness, the awfulness of misleading souls as to eternal things. These Galatians were living in their sins, they were living in idolatry, in the darkness of pagan superstition, when Paul came to them and preached the glorious gospel that tells how Christ died for our sins, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3-4. They were saved, for you know the gospel of the grace of God works. It is wonderful when you see a man who has been living in all kinds of sin, and God by the Holy Spirit brings him to repentance and leads him to believe the gospel, everything changes, old habits fall off like withered leaves, a new life is his. He has power to overcome sin, he has hope of heaven, and he has assurance of salvation. That is what God's gospel gives. These Galatians, after Paul had been used to bring them into the liberty of grace, were being misled by false teachers, men who had come down from Judea, who professed to be Christians but had never been delivered from legality. They said to these young Christians, You have only a smattering of the gospel, you need to add to this message that you have received, the teaching of the law of Moses, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved, Acts 15 verse 1. Thus they threw them back on self-effort, turning their eyes away from Christ and fixing them upon themselves and their ability to keep the law. Paul says, This thing will ruin men who depend upon their own self-efforts to get to heaven, they will miss the gates of pearl. No matter how earnest they are, if they depend upon their own works they will never be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So far as these Galatians who were really born again were concerned, this false doctrine could not be the means of their eternal perdition, yet it would rob them of the joy and gladness that the Christian ought to have. How could anyone have peace who believed that salvation depended on his own efforts? How could he be certain that he had paid enough attention to the demands of the law or ritual? It is the gospel of the grace of God which believed gives men full assurance. And so the Apostle Paul was very indignant to find people bringing in something else instead of the gospel of the grace of God, and he is surprised that these Galatians who rejoiced in the liberty of Christ should be so ready to go back to the bondage of law. I marvel, he says, that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He marvels that they should so soon be turned aside from the message of grace. What is grace? It is God's free, unmerited favor to those who have merited the very opposite. These Galatians, like ourselves, had merited eternal judgment, they deserved to be shut away from the presence of God forever, as you and I deserve to be, but through the preaching of grace they had been brought to see that God has a righteousness which He offers freely to unrighteous sinners who put their faith in His blessed Son. But now, occupied with legal ceremonies, laws, rules, and regulations, they had lost the joy of grace and had become taken up with self-effort. Paul says, I cannot understand it, and yet after all, it is very natural for these poor hearts of ours. How often you see people who seem to be wonderfully converted, and then they lose it all as they get occupied with all kinds of questions, rules, ceremonies, and ritual. God would have each heart occupied with His blessed Son, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2 verse 3 I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. In our King James Version we read, another gospel, and then verse 7 continues, which is not another. That sounds like a contradiction, but there are two different Greek words used here. The first is the word heteron, 
something contrary to sound teaching, something different. The Apostle says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, to a different, gospel. This mixture of law and grace is not God's gospel, not something to be added to what you have already received, not something to complete the gospel message, it is opposed to that, it is a heterodox message, one opposed to sound teaching. There is only one gospel. Go through the book from Genesis to Revelation and there is only one gospel, that first preached in the Garden of Eden when the message went forth that the seed of the woman should bruise Satan's head. That was the gospel, salvation through the coming Christ, the Son of God born of a woman. It is the same gospel preached to Abraham. We read in this book that the gospel was before preached to Abraham. God took him out one night and said, Look at the stars, count them. And Abraham said, I cannot count them. He said, Look at the dust of the earth, and count the dust. Abraham said, I cannot count it. Well, think of the sand at the seashore, count the grains of sand. And Abraham said, I cannot count them. And God answered, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, Genesis 22 verse 18. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, Genesis 13 verse 16. Abraham might have said, Impossible. My seed? I have no child, and I am already a man advanced in years, and my wife is an elderly woman. Impossible. But God had given the word, In thy seed, which is Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That was the gospel, all nations to be blessed through Christ, the seed of Abraham. And, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, Romans 4 verse 3. He was justified by faith because he believed the gospel. It is the same gospel that we find running through the book of Psalms. David, stained with sin, the twin sins of adultery and murder, cries, Thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it, thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalm 51 verses 16 to 17 Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow, Psalm 51 verse 7. And there is only one way a poor sinner can be purged, and that is by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. David looked on in faith to the Christ, the Son of God, and his hope was in this one gospel. It is the gospel that Isaiah proclaimed when he looked down through the ages and cried, He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed, Isaiah 53 verse 5. It was the gospel that Jeremiah preached when he said, This is his name whereby he shall be called, The Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah 23 verse 6. It was the gospel of Zechariah, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, Zechariah 13 verse 7. This was the gospel that John the Baptist preached. He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and as he pointed to Jesus he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1 verse 29. And this was the gospel that Jesus himself proclaimed when he said, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, John 3 verse 16. This was Peter's gospel when he spoke of Jesus, saying, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, Acts 10 verse 43. This was the gospel of the Apostle John who said, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin, 1 John 1 verse 7. This was the gospel of the Apostle James who said, of his own will begot he us with the word of truth, James 1 verse 18. This is the gospel that they will celebrate through all the ages to come as millions and millions of redeemed sing their song of praise, unto him that loveth us, and loosed us from our sins in his own blood.
Revelation 1 verse 5 RV. And this was Paul's gospel when he declared, Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, Acts 13 verses 38-39. One gospel. And there is no other. I have often felt sorry when I have heard some of my brethren whom I have learned to love in the truth, and with whom I hold a great deal in common, try to explain some apparent differences throughout the gospel centuries and talk as though there are a number of different gospels. Some say when Christ was on earth and in the early part of the book of Acts, they preached the gospel of the kingdom but did not know the grace of God. I wonder whether they remember the words of John 3 verse 16 and John 1 verse 29, and recollect that it was the Lord who said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John 5 verse 24. How short our memories are sometimes, if we say that Jesus was not preaching grace when here on earth when Scripture says, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, John 1 verse 17. Can we say that Peter and his fellow apostles in the early part of Acts were not preaching grace when it was Peter who declared, to him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins? Acts 10 verse 43. There is only one gospel. They say there is one gospel of the kingdom, another gospel of the grace of God, then there is the gospel of the glory, and some day there will be the everlasting gospel, and that these are all different gospels. If such statements were true, these words of Paul would fall to the ground, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Someone wrote me that she was surprised that a man who ought to know better should talk about there being only one gospel. Why, she said, even Dr. C. I. Schofield would teach you better, because in his Bible he shows that there are four Gospels. I want to read you what Dr. Schofield says, in his notes on Revelation 14 verse 6. This great theme may be summarized as follows. 1. In itself the word Gospel means good news. 2. Four forms of the Gospel are to be distinguished. 1. The Gospel of the Kingdom. This is the good news that God purposes to set up on the earth, in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, a kingdom, political, spiritual, Israelitish, universal, over which God's Son, David's heir, shall be king, and which shall be, for one thousand years, the manifestation of the righteousness of God in human affairs. Two preachings of this gospel are mentioned, one past, beginning with the ministry of John the Baptist, continued by our Lord and His disciples, and ending with the Jewish rejection of the King. The other is yet future, during the Great Tribulation, and immediately preceding the coming of the King in glory. 2. The Gospel of the Grace of God. This is the good news that Jesus Christ, the rejected King, has died on the cross for the sins of the world, that He was raised from the dead for our justification, and that by Him all that believe are justified from all things. This form of the gospel is described in many ways. It is the gospel, of God, because it originates in His love, of Christ, because it flows from His sacrifice, and because He is the alone object of gospel faith, of the grace of God, because it saves those whom the law curses, of the glory, because it concerns Him who is in the glory, and who is bringing the many sons to glory, of our salvation, because it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, of the uncircumcision, because it saves wholly apart from forms and ordinances, of peace, because through Christ it makes peace between the sinner and God, and imparts inward peace. 3. The Everlasting Gospel. This is to be preached to the earth dwellers at the very end of the Great Tribulation and immediately preceding the judgment of the nations. It is neither the gospel of the kingdom, nor of grace. Though its burden is judgment, not salvation, it is good news to Israel and to those who, during the tribulation, have been saved. 4. That which Paul calls, my gospel. 
This is the gospel of the grace of God in its fullest development, but includes the revelation of the result of that gospel in the outcalling of the Church, her relationships, position, privileges, and responsibility. It is the distinctive truth of Ephesians and Colossians, but interpenetrates all of Paul's writings. These words are very clear. There is only one gospel, and that is God's good news concerning His Son, but it takes on different aspects at different times according to the circumstances and conditions in which men are found. In Old Testament times they looked on to the coming of the Saviour, but they proclaimed salvation through His atoning death. In the days of John the Baptist stress was laid upon the coming kingdom, and the king was to lay down his life. In the days of the Lord's ministry on earth he presented himself as king, but was rejected and went to the cross, for he himself declared that he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many, Matthew 20 verse 28. During the early chapters of the book of Acts we find this gospel proclaimed to Jews and Gentiles alike offering free salvation to all who turn to God in repentance, but when God raised up the Apostle Paul, he gave him a clearer vision of the gospel than any one had yet had. He showed that not only are men forgiven through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, but that they are justified from all things, and stand in Christ before God as part of a new creation. This is a fuller revelation of the good tidings, but the same gospel. By and by, during the days of the Great Tribulation, the everlasting gospel will be proclaimed, telling men that the once rejected Christ shall come again to set up his glorious kingdom, but even in that day men will be taught that salvation is through his precious blood, for as the result of that preaching a great multitude will be brought out of all kindreds and tongues who have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Reverse 714 Yes, there is only one gospel and if anyone comes preaching any other gospel, telling you there is any other way of salvation save through the atoning work of the Lord Jesus, it is a heterodox gospel. Some such had come to Galatia and perverted the gospel of Christ, and it is this that led Paul in the intensity of his zeal for that gospel to exclaim, as guided by the Holy Spirit who inspired him, though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be, anathema, let him be devoted to judgment, if he is substituting anything for the precious gospel of the grace of God. Notice, if the angel who proclaims the everlasting gospel in the days of the great tribulation preaches any other gospel than that of salvation through faith in Christ alone, that angel comes under the curse, for Paul says, though, an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Out west I often met disciples of Joseph Smith, and when I got them in a corner with the Word of God and they could not wiggle out, they would say, Well, we have what you do not have. An angel came to Joseph Smith and gave him the Book of Mormon. And so they reasoned that the Bible is not enough, because an angel had revealed something different. I do not believe in the prophet Joseph Smith, and I do not believe that an angel ever appeared to him, unless it was in a nightmare. But if he did, then that angel was from the pit and he is under the curse, because, though, an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. People may say, but Paul, you are all worked up, you are losing your temper. You know, if you become very fervent for the truth, folks say you are losing your temper. If you say strong things in defense of the truth, they will declare you are unkind, but men will use very fervent language about politics and other things, and yet no one questions their loss of temper, but they think we should be very calm when people tear the Bible to pieces. If anything calls for fervent and intense feelings it is the defense of the gospel against false teaching. Lest anyone should say, Well, Paul, you would not have written that if you had been calmer, you would not have used such strong language, Paul repeats himself in verse 9, and says, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be, anathema. That is cool enough. He is not speaking now as one wrought up. He has had time to think it over and has weighed his words carefully. Yes, on sober, 
second thought he again insists on what he declared before, that the divine judgment hangs over any man who seeks to mislead lost humanity by telling them of any other way of salvation save through the precious atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In closing I put the question to you, on what are you resting your hope for eternity? Are you resting on the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you trusting the gospel of the grace of God? By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, Ephesians 2 verse 8.